Okay, welcome everyone who are joining us. Uh, we will wait another 30 seconds because the attendees are still stepping in. You are welcome to drop comments or questions in the chat and in the Q&A throughout the whole webinar and we will pick them up. All right, I can see that participants are still joining, but we'll start speaking a little bit. Uh, anyway, so welcome. I'm Caroline, I work in JPI Urban Europe. We are a transnational research and innovation program and a knowledge hub for urban transitions. And a key feature in our program are joint calls where urban stakeholders can apply for funding uh, to research and innovation projects. And today we will listen to a summary of insights from one such call, and namely the Smart Urban Futures call. And today's webinar is a preview and a sneak peek of the insights with the synthesis work of this finalized call. The reports will launch in full on the web uh, soon after the webinar. However, uh, this is your chance to grasp the summary and contribute with your thoughts and questions. And today we will start with a presentation uh, by Robert Halleck, who will present uh, some numbers from this call, but also some contributions to policy objectives by the projects. And then we will interview Katarina Larsen, who in turn interviewed um, four of projects about their impact and legacy now that they're finalized. And we'll then open up a panel discussion with some of these projects, uh, as well as with uh, Christian Wilk from the European Commission and uh, Jonas Bilund from uh, Urban Europe. So that's to come. And the transnational research and innovation projects funded in ENSUF, they set out in 2017 uh, to work on both urgent but also long term urban challenges uh, through co creation and multi stakeholder methods. And the majority of projects in JP Urban Europe create policy recommendations to ensure long term effect of their findings. And this collection that you can see on the screen now is an uh, overview from the ENSOF projects uh, and it's available on our web. It has been grouped into three categories, uh, urban growth and decline, flood resilient cities uh, and improving urban neighborhoods. And what's interesting is that about half of these ENSOF projects have practiced methods that are central to urban living labs. And there are even signs of Urban Living Labs 2.0 amongst these projects. And 2.0 is an ongoing effort in the JP Urban Europe community to make sure that Urban Living Labs make a stronger contribution to urban transformation. And you can read more about this on our web. And although the projects have worked on very different types of topics, uh, in their recommendations uh, for what it takes to, to create smart urban futures, uh, most of them underline inclusivity. And several recommendations target uh, inequality and how neglected urban areas carry a key role for urban robustness. Interestingly, uh, they also emphasize learning as a way to scale up results. And in summary, most of the ENSIF projects have challenged business as usual in urban infrastructures and in urban governance. And they reflect critically on the term smart urban futures and they explore 
how learning and alternative narratives and place development is currently practiced in European cities and where this is taking us. You can find plenty of resources on our web, everything from contact info to these projects and all our other calls, um, more policy recommendations, urban living labs, insights and projects, uh, and how you can get involved in JPR Urban Europe. All right, I will give the screen to you, uh, Robert, for a little synthesis presentation. Thank you so much, Caroline. I hope you see my screen now. Is, is everything working out on your end? Yeah, looks good. Excellent. So again, thank you very much for the opportunity to work with you on this synthesis of the ends of call. And I will present an ends of in a nutshell, some numbers on ends of, and then uh, a sneak peek into the synthesis work on the con contributions to the policy objectives. So we had the pleasure of working through uh, almost all the um, ends of project outputs that we were uh, that were available to us to go through all websites and look what really um, you were working on during the ends of call but let me start out with explaining a little bit of our work that was jointly produced also with Katharina Berger at the Austrian Institute of Technology and AIT the Austrian Institute of Technology supports the JPI Urban Europe in monitoring and evaluation so this is also part of part of that work in ends of we had 15 projects with a very wide variety of stakeholders uh, present in the project consortia so we see a lot of universities but also governmental institutions cities non-profit organizations businesses and research organizations present in the uh, uh, consortia. Um, but this is not all because a lot more stakeholders were involved, were actively involved in these projects. These are only the stakeholders that we have uh, available in the consortia as official project partners. When we look at uh, the countries, we see uh, partners from all over Europe uh, joining these consortia and beyond um, with partners also from Asia. So when I say that there are a lot more stakeholders involved in these projects, well, we have um, a lot of cities and city stakeholders, uh, city representatives uh, actively participating in the project or being uh, or cooperating with these projects in um, a variety of ways. Actually, the ends of call is the call with the largest number of city stakeholders involved among the JPI Urban Europe um, calls. What you see here in yellow are the cities that are either, either involved as case study areas, uh, involved in uh, hosting living labs um, of the ends of calls, and in, in blue, the ones that are also um, in the project consortia. So what does this mean? Uh, this means that the ends of call created a very dense network um, of project partners uh, creating knowledge flows around Europe. What you see here is the network of project partners with hubs in the United Kingdom, in Belgium and in the Netherlands that are connected to a lot of different uh, countries via project partner networks, but also those countries with few project partners are connected. So these are not just one-off uh, partners, but have a lot of different links. So we had the pleasure not only to look at the project uh, consortia and the project data, but also at the project outputs. So what we did is we looked at more than 112 PDFs, book chapters, uh, policy recommendations, case studies. Uh, we looked at more than uh, 30 annual project reports where you were also summarizing um, the work on the, uh, during the project. And we scraped all project websites that were available. So most of the projects um, have all also uploaded and created their own uh, website with several projects um, publishing their own research, publishing blogs um, on the websites. So what you see in the bar chart here is the publication type that we connect, uh, collected and we classified a lot of these um, studies as case studies. This is a broad term 
that includes everything from uh, description of uh, um, living lab works in individual um, cities to uh, real case study uh, um, case studies that are also termed in that way. But what we see is a broad portfolio on uh, uh, types of output. Let's look, look at this um, or by project. And what you see here on the left is the um, published work in terms of PDF book chapters um, and so on, what you saw before. And on the right-hand side, the, the digital outputs, the websites, the blogs that we scraped, that we collected. And something that I want to highlight here is that um, even if uh, this, these bars are not very high for one or the other project, then it's mostly the case that this were uh, very detailed, very large outputs. For example, um, developed apps or um, books that, uh, that are based on the project. So this gives you an account of the number of outputs, but doesn't really fully account for the depth and breadth of, of these outputs. So let's take a one step closer. Let's look at the themes that are that came up in the ends of projects by looking at the project abstracts. Um, what we see here is the connection of terms that that arose in the project abstracts. So um, to the the sizes of these circles are larger, the more often these terms came up, and the connections of these terms are uh, represent how often they, um, they come up together. And what we see here is that um, there are around four clusters here, for example, on the blue, in the blue, on the left side, the, the housing uh, and manufacturing, uh, the planning side, we see uh, on the red, in the red at the top, the stakeholder uh, and, and public space creation, placemaking uh, cluster. Um, and these are also relatively congruent with the um, call topics. So we also went uh, one step further and tried to tag the project output. So try to tag all the publications that we had, all the texts, all the um, websites and blogs based on a taxonomy that links text, text, text to SDG targets. So that we could see um, what SDGs are addressed in the projects and uh, in the project outputs. And when we look at this visualization, we see that, um, not to our surprise, it, uh, we largely find um, projects addressing SDG 11 to make cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. But there is also a large chunk of project outputs addressing poverty and in, within the po poverty SDG, it is mostly related to um, the target on resilience and creating uh, resilient societies. And similarly for um, SDG 13, SDG 13, which is the climate change related um, sustainable development goal. This is also mostly related to, um, to resilience, creating resilient cities, creating resilient societies. Um, so what you will find in the, um, in the synthesis report that is going to be published soon is also a link to other um, policy objectives that were either mentioned in the, by the project directly or that were tagged um, with these um, text content analysis um, tagging items. Um, for example, the um, European Urban Initiative uh, or the, the uh, urban agenda, the European Green Deal. So keep your peels, uh, eyes peeled for the output, and I'm looking forward to discussing the um, the these findings with you uh, in the panel discussion. Thank you. So you're all welcome with uh, questions on the, this presentation or to Robert. Uh, at any point during the webinar. Um, I would have a question. Yeah. I was wondering, uh, how do you explain the geographical focus or center on uh, GB, Great Britain, Belgium, Netherlands, and France? I mean, were the hubs 
before it focused around these countries or were the hubs created in these countries because the focus was turned out to be on these countries? So I do think that this is an, if, if we can t answer this directly, an, uh, an ex ante sort of uh, pattern. So this means that um, the larger funding volumes in certain countries leading to more um, project partners coming from these countries and um, the, the, the best predictor, so to say, for cooperations is cooperations in the past. So many, many times project partners continue to work or or work with um, cities that are related to them, either from previous previous work or from um, geographical proximity. So, so when you mentioned hubs in those countries, they were established after you realized that participation from these countries was stronger, or were the hubs already existing? This is um, what I realized after I saw that um, the what projects formed. Okay, thanks. So we have a question also in the chat. Um, digital outputs. Uh, what kind of outputs were these? Like some projects have hundreds of outputs, and this is also what I think. We discussed this, Robert, that uh, it doesn't really say anything about what was actually going on in the project. Like some put out a lot of tweets. That doesn't mean you had, you know. Um, so we're going to step into what's hiding behind the numbers uh, in a second here via the interviews. But do you have any comment on this? What are these digital outputs? Absolutely. So Caroline, you mentioned it already. Just the numbers is not telling us a lot. Uh, about the the content or the, the depth of, of the content. What we did here is we did count um, the, the website subsites. So we had a scraping algorithm that downloaded the entire website um, and we were able to analyze the, the content of these sites. And um, when we looked at this manually, we do see that uh, projects such as, just to name a few examples, Urban Education Live, had a very extensive website with um, with a lot of content being published on the website. Um, so this is captured in the these hundreds of, of digital outputs um, for for urban education life. But for example, um, Flood City Sense uh, created a, a an app that is very rich, but is still represented in the bar chart as just a, a, a small number of outputs uh, from the website. So do not misjudge these numbers. The, the content is far more important than just the, 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 the frequency. Mm. Um, so we also have a question about uh, SDG 11. I'm no expert. I don't know if you are, Robert, but um, if whether or not it relates to the level of neighborhood or only to the city as a whole unit. Um, that's more of a what is SDG 11 question, but it's uh, it's about the city on the whole level, but the bits and parts of that goal, of course, includes neighborhood level work as well. That would be my reflection. What do you say, Robert? Um, I'm also not an expert on this, uh, and I think uh, I, I agree with you that I think it's um, cities and communities um, that is addressed here. Mm. I think we can come back to that question later in the panel. We have many uh, competences with us here who can help out. All right, but uh, before we move on, what did you find most interesting, Robert? Is there anything that you that surprised you or that made you really happy studying these numbers about the about the outputs? Any reaction from your side? So I think um, the the ends of call is one of the most interesting JPA um, Europe calls because of the involvement of, of cities and the partnerships that that uh, arose from that and. This is really not just um, cities as uh, as case study areas. So we see a lot of very deep collaboration with uh, city representatives in the ends of projects, which I found uh, most interesting. Yeah, it's an incredible amount of cities involved. Uh, Oswald, 
Do you have a question? Yeah, I had a question. I mean, do this. I mean, I don't know if you went into this, but do these numbers meet the expectations you all had at the start of the project or of the call? I mean, you must have had expectations. We hope to reach this. Do they sort of meet these expectations? Hmm. Maybe we can come back to that in the panel because we have colleagues with us who were with us from the start of the ENSOF call. So I think we can pick that up in a bit. I think that's a good idea. Yeah. Okay, so what is really hiding behind these numbers? Uh, what's been going on? We, uh, we have Katarina Larsen with us. Uh, and you, Katarina, uh, interviewed four of the ENSOF projects. Uh, I'm very jealous. I also wanted to talk in depth with them, see <laughs> what their conclusions were more in depth. Um, so you talked to Soho Lab and you talked to Smart Urbi or Smart Urban Intermediaries. I, I vary between the two names sometimes. Uh, bright Future and Capacity. Correct. <laughs> yes, that's and we right. have uh, we have uh, everyone but Soho Lab with us here today in the panel. So you will hear some more from them in a bit. Um, so Katarina, it's very interesting to find. I find to to read about the results in terms of you know capacity building because. When it comes to sustainability and urban transitions, there's already plenty of knowledge about the what, but this is really about the, the how. So I find that very interesting. And one thing that you, that you wrote in the report that we're about to publish is that the, the interviews with the project leaders showed a long-term commitment to working with questions of local capacity building. Could you, could you develop uh, a bit this quote? Sure, and uh, I just wanted to start also by thanking all the project teams that I talked to for their time. I know it's been a busy time for many different reasons. Uh, so I'm working as a researcher at KKH, the Royal Institute of Technology, and I had the chance to talk to uh, four of these projects. Uh, so including the colleagues uh, from the projects that are with us today and also with uh, the team of the Soho Lab in the Italian branch located in Milano with Elena uh, Marignani and uh, Francesca Cugnetti. So um, the focus was to learn more about how you have actually worked in practice and now that you reached uh, uh, the end part of the project period, uh, we also wanted to have some time to reflect on uh, what were the ways that you have worked with uh, creating dialogues with the residents and the case areas that you have been looking at. And um, uh, it's, it's been a, a true, uh, uh, truly an interesting journey to hear your experiences. So we were interested in hearing some examples and also some um, reflections, reflections from you about uh, what you thought that you have learned from the projects. Uh, so we have, we have some, uh, some key insights that I think we will dive a bit into uh, together with, with you, uh, Caroline, and also in the, in the panel discussion. Some key lessons that we list from the project that is also available uh, to the audience here. And um, we, we saw that uh, a lot of the uh, project uh, stressed the importance of being on site. <laughs> so, um, I mean, that's part of the, the nature of the call that it had to do with developing local capabilities and how can you draw on the, uh, the strengths, but also the challenges that uh, these areas were, were articulating. So the voices of the people living in the areas was very important uh, to, um, uh, to the team. So that's one, one thing we, we learned from, from these dialogues. Mm. And what, what were the signs that there was a long-term commitment? How could you read that from the, from the discussions? 
because it, I know a lot of projects is challenged by the usually three time, a uh, three year timeline. What were the the indications that you saw that they were committed for it in the long run? Yes. Yeah, so what what I've learned from talking to these these are four projects that I talked to in order to be able to get some more in depth um, uh, conclusions. So we saw that uh, in a lot of cases, they, these were questions they, that they had been working with for a long time. And the uh, ENSIF call gave some leverage to uh, continue to work with these questions, uh, but also to draw on the existing uh, networks they had in the local area. So in order to have these dialogues, they needed to be on site. <laughs> I can mm -hmm. maybe give the example of, of uh, the Italian colleagues uh, in the Soho lab, they're not unfortunately not, not here to represent themselves. So I'll give use that as an example that uh, they had for a long time been in uh, the area around San Siro in, in Milan, where there are uh, a lot of um, uh, it's a diverse community and a lot of contrasting uh, interest in the area and a lot of ethnic groups that are represented. So in order to have a dialogue and to um, build trust, they needed to be on site. And what was interesting in that case was that it was also part of the university uh, strategy and this third mission to also work with some outreach activities in addition to missions of teaching and, um, and research. So uh, being on site to, uh, to enable dialogues in order to pick up uh, pressing questions, you know, what what were the residents' view on what was the, the most important questions to deal with for their community? So rather than the researchers imposing questions on the local community to be open and to be there on site for, for having these types of dialogues. And this was also the case for um, other projects that I talked to, um, to, uh, to have this early on discussion with, uh, with the people that were living in the areas or local businesses in the areas to to capture the uh, their interest and also to have the interaction with uh, what language they were using to be involved in a process that was co-creative you were creating things together rather than uh, mm. imposing a, a template for how things should be should be discussed mm. and while doing so, uh, another role of the research team teams was to be the mediating door opener so that new and sometimes unexpected actors could get involved. Who were these unexpected actors? Do you have an example of this and how yes. they were door opening for these? <laughs> Yeah, so I think that that was characterizing some of the discussions I had with the project teams that they deliberately kept the process open. So they had uh, a long experience from working in these areas. So they had a good idea what actors they should talk to, but also having an open um, approach to that. There, there may be other actors that they did not include in their, in their project application sketch uh, or the application that they sent in. So uh, just to give some examples, it could be a, a private company that uh, was uh, employing a lot of residents in the area, so it would have a large impact on what type of infrastructure if you wanted to improve uh, the possibility for biking or for uh, leaving the car at home, then including those types of private companies that uh, would have a, a large impact on, you know, what the infrastructure and what needs that would be in the area. Mm -hmm. So that, that's one example to, to do that, but also I think we could also see that um, they were well connected and had some good ideas about how to reach policymakers. But I mean, that's a process that often comes towards the end of the project. So um, being able to also connect with actors that would be important for implementation of the results, uh, that was one, one important aspect that was also mentioned. Mm. And one of these, correct me if I'm wrong, but one of these unexpected actors was a big pharmaceutical company in one case that was, uh, yeah, that was operating in the 
uh, in the neighborhood and their employees made a huge impact on how the infrastructure around the hospital look like because if they take the car to work or if they don't take the car to work that's that was one of those situations yeah so that was one example and i think yeah. uh, one of our panelists could say a bit more yeah. about that <laughs> yeah. later on uh, but for sure to be open with the process to not discriminate uh, new new ideas or new actors that would come in later in the process of the project mm. um, so that was uh, mm. one one Open key process. lesson as well mm. and and in uh, the interview study uh, you present five uh, general lessons about how to create impact and in capacity building from from what we learned from the ends of projects um, one is that you mentioned now to catalyze both on local capacity and your international teams. Do, do you want to say something about this? Because it sounds challenging, but I can also see it. Obviously, this is a very um, big feature in many JP Urban Europe projects that are transnational. Like, how do you make that happen to be on site locally and also learn across countries and cities? Yes, uh, but thank you for, for making that point as well. And um, this, this also relates maybe to some of the previous discussion that was raised to who was, who was actually involved in these hubs. And so the, it was drawing on uh, a, a great uh, experience working with these questions and local networks, but also the call itself, since it had an international uh, component and the outline you you would team up with your international colleagues then that would also create some new connections to uh, that was enabling them to make uh, comparison between similar cases similar areas uh, but located within different national contexts so uh, in a way that provided them to with some examples from the discussions we had to reflect a bit on if we are um, trying to work with a similar set of projects, but they are in different national contexts. So how have the national policies and the national context tried to address those questions? And what are the lessons we can learn from that? So um, the, the call itself created some possibilities to draw on the local, uh, the local uh, knowledge, but also to uh, to make some new international connections, to make this type of cross-national comparative reflections. Mm. Well. Uh, so that's what's behind the local and international um, yeah. example here. And we have some questions from the chat, um, but just to see this number five there, the lesson number five, conceptual developments during practical exercises uh, could you just explain a bit what that was about did they is that that they um, explored concepts by trying them out in place or how did so, so this example is from one of the uh, participants in the panel today uh, the smart urban urban intermediaries mm -hmm. where uh, they worked a lot with also concepts and how how can they have a dialogue with practitioners uh, on these concepts? So um, the approach was to also uh, work with uh, particip participatory workshops or local labs in the neighborhoods that they were working with. So uh, to have these types of dialogues with, with the local residents uh, in uh, some uh, areas mm -hmm. in, in the UK and also in Copenhagen and the Netherlands. So maybe this is an example of mm -hmm. some of the hubs that we saw on the maps yeah. <laughs> earlier on. Um, but to create a, a dialogue and deliberation about the challenges and how they can work uh, and create processes that enable this type of learning that we discussed in the local neighborhoods. Mm. Uh, so they were stressing and I'm sure we'll hear more about that in the panel, uh, to have these uh, discussions early on, not to create a framework that was uh, rigid, but rather to have an open process. Mm. Uh, and also to think about how can we create participatory formats and facilitation techniques 
uh, that would invite people in different contexts. Uh, if you would have a, a festival to invite people to give their views on the, what would a local neighborhood look like uh, in a future city. Um, so I think to conclude, it was a very creative approach to, uh, to think about interaction and participatory approaches and this co-creation process that we often talk about in, in research. We want mm. things to be uh, co-created, but how? <laughs> so I think the, the work that, uh, that we have learned from this project is that they, they did a good job in crafting very tangible ways of the how question that you raised here. Mm. That's wonderful. And we have some questions in the chat that relates to, I'd say, vulnerability. Um, one question regards, how do you implement sustainability criteria in, the, in poor neighborhoods? But we also have a question about the COVID-19 pandemic and its practical impact. Um, I know some, pro some projects touched upon this because there were projects that were operating in, um, what do you say, vulnerable neighborhoods or, yeah. Do you have any reflection on the pandemic and uh, the work for the projects? Yes, yeah, so those were two questions. And the first had to do with the, how, how can this be seen in the context of socially vulnerable areas and mm. SDG 11, if I understood it correctly. And mm. uh, looking at the SDG 11 with the uh, ambition to uh, make cities and human settlements inclusive, safe and resilient and sustainable. It's a, it's a, it's a big uh, ambition, mm. but I think the inclusiveness and resilience was something that uh, touch upon what, um, what some of these projects were aiming to work with. Um, and how, how is that adapted to these, these uh, cases that they were working with? So um, there were some uh, of these projects that uh, also drafted and created um, policy uh, guidelines for local uh, policymakers. So uh, working with uh, these types of targeted uh, information to policymakers, uh, giving quite uh, clear instructions about what's, what's different if you're thinking about an urban living lab in, in this context. Um, so um, I think that that's one, one answer to that question mm -hmm. that they deliberately were giving policy lessons for, for, mm -hmm. the, for, the, for the politicians in the areas. Um, mm -hmm. And with regards to the pandemic, I, I read, you know, from, from the interviews with with these projects that uh, it was of course the pandemic hit hit hard in many different ways and uh, maybe in particular for for some of these areas that they they also had to adapt their project um, approach towards some of them towards the end of the project because of the pandemic uh, so i guess the answer to that is that uh, a lot of the projects were were approaching their final phase so the um, writing up their conclusion towards the, the time period when the pandemic uh, reach, reach us uh, and had a, a strong impact. So maybe that's a, there's a need for some follow up and mm -hmm. some, some lessons learned. You know, how, how did the whole pandemic situation affect these type of projects that are aiming to be on site and being uh, locally embedded and also to create practical um, suggestions for how, how we can change things. Um, some of the lessons was that they were also creating this type of tools for um, project um, members, but also for the residents. You know, how can we create change? How can we make uh, our processes more inclusive? So these types of mini games was something that was mentioned by one of the interviews who that uh, they were creating ways for the residents to be involved and to uh, also to drive processes themselves. Um, but definitely, this is something for maybe for mm -hmm. another another call as yeah, well to follow up. What are the lessons here? 
yeah and that the panelists you're welcome to comment also what how, what it was like to to finalize these projects during the pandemic because just like you're saying Katarina it's almost like you're wrapping up and here we are and here are all the incredible things that we did and policymakers are busy handling a crisis but um yeah it's a it's a specific situation for sure um, we have another question in the chat that's a little well interesting but tricky i think it can also have some panelists comment on it uh, but the question regards whether these five general lessons are very different uh, or specific to the case at hand like cities or are they in line with general requirements for co-creation and capacity building do you have any reflection on this katarina whether this is very particular for for cities or urban matters or more at large that's a very good question the the five lessons that we draft and describe here are uh, are drawing on on the interviews and in the mm. uh, um, discussions and dialogues with with these four projects so uh, the approach was to have some in in-depth discussion rather than scraping on the surface so i would say that they are uh, specific to this type of areas that we uh, that the ENSIF projects are uh, are working with but having mm -hmm. said that um we, we know that you know being being on site and involving users and involving residents is also uh, considered to be a way to create robust solutions uh, colleagues in general uh, mm. yeah colleagues such as uh, andy sterling for example has has raised the question about how how do we create robust solutions when it comes to dealing with risk and dealing with um how we want our neighborhoods to look in in the future so uh it has a specific uh, <laughs> um, notion drawing on what we learned from the the project teams but mm. also uh we know that you know being being on site and involving different range of users is something that also enables more robust solutions mm. And if uh, anyone listening in has a comment on this and reflection, you're very welcome in the chat to discuss there or, or post questions. Um, before we step into uh, a panel discussion, and uh, uh, any final comments from you, Katarina? Like, what was most interesting to you uh, during these interviews, or what do you what do you feel like you take with you? Any specific insight or? Well, in addition to these uh, Many general insights. lessons, uh, <laughs> we I think well two things really that uh, we we learned that the project had been very uh, creative and crafting uh, very hands-on tools for the residents in the area. So rather than being uh, concerned with how to how to get things published in the most prestigious journals and uh, of course that was also uh, something that was going on mm. uh, in parallel they they were crafting some tools that uh, was intended for use uh, by the people living in these areas mm. uh, so a lot of creativity in uh, in how to how to create tools that would be useful for for the residents uh, and then the second thing would be the stage where we are now you know what what type of uh after afterlife do these projects have or do they need some kind of special aftercare to draw uh, and um, provide leverage to what what these teams have learned maybe quite late in the process because creating these dialogues takes time uh, and and the pandemic situation had also some impact on how mm. we could execute the final phase. So I guess that's a question for uh, for for the program to take on board. You know how how can we also draw on these uh, lessons that that we have learned? Uh, mm. A lot of the projects have also uh, after these uh, the ENSIF project have have ended, uh, gone forward with other projects that. 
uh, were funded by other agencies as well. But um, mm. that would be what what is the afterlife of these projects as well? Yeah, let's ask them uh, some more. Um, a little uh, advice from the chat here. We were talking about robust solutions and uh, we can have a look at the urban futures method practiced by 3S recipe. Uh, also uh, JPI Urban Europe project. So thank you for using the chat for, for that. So uh, I will now invite the panel to unmute and turn on your video as you please. Uh, with us, we have uh, Marlene Van Holst from Smart Urban Intermediaries that Katarina talked about. We have Oswald Divish from uh, Capacity or Kappa City. I keep changing how I say it. <laughs> and we have David Boll from Bright Future. We also have with us uh, Christian Wilk um, from the European Commission and my colleague Jonas Bilund, a research and innovation officer at Urban Europe, and then Katarina and Robert, who just presented. Uh, you stay with us here too for a discussion. Um, so just a reminder that we have the project's results catalog on our web. Um, this is based on 20 results interviews that were made about a year ago. And if you're interested in handling urban dilemmas, uh, you'd be very pleased to find that these project results have been tagged with the dilemma that they correspond to. Um, so this is part of the results catalog. Um, David Boll, you're from the Bright Future Project, and you set out to translate social cultural qualities of small industrial towns into social innovation. Could you could you give us an example of, of your work? Yeah. Hi, Caroline. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for inviting me first. Yeah. Uh... What you just said sounds quite complicated, <laughs> so I might try to translate it, you know, in more day uh, terms uh, to be more, um, I would say, uh, uh, to paint a better picture for, for basically what we did. We were interested in uh, how to draft uh, future strategies, long-term strategies for small industrial towns, and what we have basically found out or basically what our premise basically was at the very start that the strategies, at least uh, that from the policymakers, but also from the academia, from the scholar side, is very much oriented towards, I would say, the obstacles, you know, the economic, the, the economic disadvantages uh, that um, small industrial towns face. And we wanted to take another perspective. We wanted to see basically, so uh, to just to take away this, I would say, disadvantages economic perspective and focus more on the advantages and mo mostly on the social uh, and the cultural advantages that uh, small industrial towns have and that can be used um, in future policy making, uh, especially strategic uh, policy making. So for instance, um, our project was uh, uh, basically two parts, the more academic part when we focused on more of the narratives uh, so on the, I would say the good stories from the past and from the present of industrial towns. Um, uh, for instance, one common story, one common narrative uh, from all case study towns, we had five altogether, was, for instance, that they were all um, experiencing solidarity, uh, a feeling of mutual help, of camaraderie that stems from working in the mines, from the miners' families, working in, in, in um, factories and so on. So this was uh, a common narrative. And then later on in the second part of the project, when we did social innovations, we asked basically our participants, so you have this, I would say, advantage, this feeling of solidarity, um, this uh, feeling of unity in your community. So how can we take this as an advantage in future um, development of your town? So this was basically the idea um, of uh, our project. And yeah, I think it produced some interesting results. Uh, and I found uh, a couple of things also from Katarina's presentation, I think, uh, in our uh, project as well. Mm. 
And uh, so when we were talking about capacities and capabilities built up, what is your reflection in terms of bright future? Yeah. Well, well for, for me, that was uh, probably the one, one of the most uh, interesting parts of the project. So especially the second part, uh, you call it um, urban labs or living labs, so we call it participatory action research. Whereas mm -hmm. for me, it was um, enlightening. To say, to say the least, for instance, um, first of all, it forced us as the researchers, because we were four academic institutions and one NGO, um, to abandon our, I would say, traditional ro role, as you know, as a white outsider, outsider that comes to a certain community, <laughs> does their research and then offers help. So we were basically, uh, by doing this participatory uh, method, we were, in a way, more of a moderators, uh, in this process. And what I think we uh, personally as researchers found out is that this process enabled us to gain a certain knowledge, I would say local knowledge that would otherwise stay hidden to us via traditional research methods, via, I don't know, carrying out interviews uh, and, uh, or other kinds of uh, methods or questionnaires and so forth. Um, when we had this iterative process doing workshops with various stakeholders, with various groups, uh, we were in a way immersed in the process. We, we, we became the, the, the line between who is doing the research and what is being researched uh, got blurred a bit and that actually provided us with a wealth of new knowledge that otherwise we wouldn't uh, get. But also from the other side, from the, I would say from the side or from the perspective of the local community that was involved, you could also see that there were certain capacities being built there. For instance, just to be maybe a bit more illustrative, um, at the first workshop, one of the, the main problems that arose uh, when they were when the local community was, for instance, was um, marking the biggest problems in the local community, uh, they marked as the the, the first problem they marked uh, was the, um, how, how do they call it, uh, the lack of inclusion or uh, of the certain ethnic community. So they said that was the biggest problem problem in their local community. And then started talking about that. So they were in the second workshop, third workshop. Uh, and that workshop also enabled them to be more reflective, you know, to be maybe more, maybe more critical. What are the real problems? What are the perceived problems? Maybe what was also um, maybe as an expression of populism uh, in their community. And for me, it was very surprising to find out that after the third workshop, when we then again, you know, um, uh, ranked the biggest problem in the local community, they actually put the problem of the Albanian minority on, on the very last place. So the whole process of doing participatory research also enabled the community themselves to reflect certain things in their community. And to see basically certain expressions of populism, cheap populism in their community as well, and to be in a way more reflective, more realistic about problems in their local community. So that for me uh, was uh, basically a sort of an evidence that this kind of research, that uh, living labs uh, are a two-way process. So it's not just a means to get, to get your results to for researchers that uh, they get validated or disseminated. Is also uh, a process where the community learns with you, maybe changes certain perspectives, um, gets involved, uh, changes their perspective about certain social groups, about inclusivity, and so on. And that's why I think this method basically is fantastic. And uh, when you think about and uh, doing uh, research on development or talking about development, local community development, I don't think that you can really do it without any kind of, you know, uh, co-creation or participation from the local community. And I don't mean it uh, in a, I would say, tokenistic way when you do <laughs> something just for the sake of it. I mean, mm -hmm. when you do it for real, uh, when you're open mm -hmm. um, for suggestions and uh, you're inclusive for all social groups. Yeah. And it's interesting because it comes back to how do you, you mentioned changed perspectives on things. It's very yeah. difficult to explain and showcase, but you know it was there. And what happens when you when you leave because these perspectives were changed or you challenged mm -hmm. how the view on this industrial or yeah post-industrial 
neighborhoods were and what it is like now and how they view their own capabilities to handle whatever transition they need need to make it's um, it's tricky to yeah communicate or mm -hmm. follow up on but it's interesting yeah i think that we made some great progress there especially because industrial communities across uh, europe are in a way you know they are they are rebelling against being ignored by policymakers, also by academia, the search in populist votes. And we actually saw it, at least four of our case study towns had the same problem. I mean, they were actually very successful industrial towns. They were booming, low unemployment, high wages, but they were all dealing with the same problem, the rise of populism, uh, radical parties. And you could actually sense uh, where that was coming from. And you could actually also sense the way that perspectives changed uh, uh, when uh, the debate started to uh, happen. Mm. And I would maybe also like to mention one thing that is actually, I think, crucial when we're talking about uh, uh, co-creation and participation or living labs. That is that when you choose uh, this method, uh, you really need to pay attention to um, the stakeholders that are invited. I mean, if, if you just invite the stakeholders, I think what happened, for instance, for us at the first workshop was that all the inequalities from the real world were reproduced mm. in, at our workshops. That part, partially probably also explains why at the first workshop, the main problem was this populist problem of a certain minority that is not integrated and is causing problems in our little town. Mm. Um, then uh, at the second and the third workshop, when we also started, um, to, uh, when we realized maybe that uh, this uh, problem of non-representation actually just mirrored itself in the real world to, to mm. our workshops as well, we made great effort also to invite uh, more marginalized uh, groups in the community, which is actually very, very hard to do. Yeah. Because, you know, there's a lack, lack of trust yeah. and things like that. But when they came, and eventually they did came, um, that really enabled, I mean, uh, the, the talks that we have, the discussions that, that we have, the exchanges of ideas. I mean, at times they were not, you know, they, they were quite difficult at times for me <laughs> as an yeah. outsider there as well, but they were fantastic because, you, because you, at, at the end we could see results and you could see that certain minds were being changed. So I think that, that this aspect, you know, um, of, um, uh, doing this kind of urban living labs and um, ensuring uh, equal representation of uh, even those, I would say, hidden social groups is very important. Yeah. Otherwise, it just replicates whatever is done in the yeah. outside in the real world. It was worth the extra mile there. Yeah, I agree. Super. Thank you very much. Please stay in the panel and in the discussion. Yeah, no <laughs> Uh, so, Marilyn Van Holst from Smart Urban Intermediaries, uh, you too ran uh, Urban Living Labs. Uh, you did so in four different cities uh, to advance the knowledge of how intermediaries, and you're welcome to explain what you mean by this in this case, how they generate smart urban development and how they create opportunities. Uh, Merlin, could you give us an example here? Yes, well, let, let me thank you uh, uh, for inviting me here and, and hi to everybody. Um, uh, thank you. Um, the, 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 uh, it's important to first point out that with a smart urban intermediaries, we just mean people, human actors in, in uh, urban, often called vulnerable neighborhoods, trying to make a difference in these neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. So they, these people are all around in these neighborhoods. They, they, they have all kinds of projects. It, it, it's, uh, well, the list is too long to, to um, what, what we looked at were different kinds of people doing different kinds of things. And so there's, there's a lot of variety, not just in uh, across uh, cities uh, in Europe, but, but also within them. And trying to bring these people together is, well, 
it's quite exciting, but also you, you get a little bit anxious. I have to, mm -hmm. I have to admit. So we're looking at their practices. We're we're trying to understand what what support they get, what 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 they need to to do their work better. And we, uh, as a, as a group, uh, also travel to different cities, not just to the countries where we were doing our research, but we uh, so that it, we we um, studied in Glasgow, in Birmingham, in Amsterdam, and in Copenhagen. But we also traveled uh, to Lisbon, and we traveled to Poland, to Krakow. Um, what astonished us is that the conversations were not that hard to uh, to trigger. So um, what 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 we were afraid of is that because the contexts are are quite different that these people would not be able to really relate but they are and they recognize uh, each, each uh, themselves in each other's work so what we did we had local uh, labs, uh, local living labs, where we talked about practices and what people ran into and how, how they try to deal with it. And then we also met internationally. And um, I think that that the, the 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 travel was something that that really got got our um, got our conversation um, going. Uh, and that's 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 something also with the pandemic. It's it's hard to uh, maintain such a thing. So we're also looking for new ways uh, to 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 make sure that that uh, conversation is ongoing. But but what you see is when you when you have this conversation over a couple of years with people that they also bring it home and that they can use it in their own work. And importantly, so so you talked about concepts before. Um, People use in their locality, they use certain concepts to, to name what they're doing and what they run into, etc. And these concepts are ways, uh, they offer ways to discuss and to learn from each other. And it's, it's a question of translation and constant translation. And I think that we as researchers, we're all doing that all of the time anyway. So we're translating things to, to some kind of mechanism or to, to more abstract uh, uh, findings. And I think that it's, it's good to, to, to have other people join in that. So uh, the local stakeholders, the, the, the people who are trying to make a difference, uh, they know better what they are doing uh, than we do, even though we can look across countries. But if we can look together with them, uh, importantly for us also, the, the, it, it, partly, and I think that's, that's also, um, it's like, like David described how they work. We, we uh, 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 group, um, as a group, we worked quite ethnographically. So it was uh, certainly from the start a more living than lab, so to speak. So you have to get these people in there who are actually doing the work and they have to help you to come up with uh, understandings of these practices and what they're dealing with. And mm -hmm. then you can start to, to, to share concepts, to share ideas and to make translations. And these things have to go on, of course. So, so these people have been working often for 10 years or, or, or even for 20 in their locality, they can bring a lot of knowledge and they also take away knowledge from, from these visits that we had across Europe. And, and for that, I think that that's, uh, urban Europe is, is a perfect uh, opportunity for, for such learning. And we couldn't have, and these people were often so locally based and, and really busy with their thing, uh, would not have had the time uh, or money uh, or other capacities to travel around and uh, find other people doing the same. And speaking of capacities, is this are these capacities and capabilities that you that you feel you you leave as as legacy, or is that something that was going on there and then? What what type of do you have an example of capacities or capabilities you built up and for whom? Yes, so so uh, I think that that uh, with the different project that that were so if we have locally in Copenhagen, for instance, there's a network and these people brought like a potluck, they br brought uh, all kinds of things together and try to share it and make sure that people get a platform to use these uh, uh, these these things that are in offer, so to speak. These 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 uh, projects are. 
uh, triggering in other places ideas about, hey, how can we extend what we are doing? We're already doing something which is alike, but we can learn from that. And we never had that idea. So we, we can, when, not just by, by, by copying it, but by translating what you learn and what you see in other cities and taking it to your own city and try to develop something like that. So partly all the knowledge is there in the different places. And we serve, uh, we ourselves are just like uh, David, I think, uh, said, uh, uh, translating and, and sort of intermediating between these different ideas and practices already in place that can be developed and socially innovated in a certain locality. Very interesting, Marilyn. Thank you. Please stay in the panel and in the discussion. And if anyone have questions along the way, you're welcome to bring them up in the chat or comments. Okay, um, Oswald from the Kappa City, Capacity Project. You developed frameworks to, to support collective capabilities. Uh, can you give us an example of, of what you learned from this? Yeah, thank you, Caroline. Uh, fantastic two projects already. I think we had uh, similar learnings. I was especially impressed by the, the Trans-European Network because it took us this project to realize what you started from. So we, we were working in a, a residential subdivisions. Now for those who maybe are aware of the, the issues there, they, they, they impose quite some challenges to, to, uh, because they're very, very expensive to maintain, to provide services and so on. But those living there, they don't accept the, the answers that policymakers give to them. I mean, the densification or the, the making smart transformations in the subdivisions are way too radical for them. So when we, with our, with our case studies, when we land in these subdivisions, I mean, they, they, um, we were not really invited there. So it, it, it is already a, a very particular um, point of departure. So how do you start a capacity building process with people who are not, who, who don't see any problem? Um, and so we, we had as an idea that um, we need to have a capacity building involving everyone. So the citizens, policymakers, maybe experts to make them all change their, their way of looking at these subdivisions. But we quickly realized that we needed to approach all of these groups separately. I guess maybe it's the same issue that David had. Some people will never come. But I mean, if you approach them separately, then maybe they're interested. So we, we um, originally wanted, or we uh, had the idea, we start with uh, very hands-on uh, enabling tools in the subdivisions. We were, would tell stories, we would make things together, we would uh, enact a possible futures, but we quickly realized that we had to keep these ways of working, but um, develop different prototyping techniques for citizens, for uh, people working at the municipality, and maybe for, for experts involved in there. Um, and that at certain moments, they all come together in the big co-production moments that David was also talking about, but a lot of the time we need to keep these trajectories separate. And when we're almost finished in the project, we realized what Merlin was starting from, that we also needed not only to support this learning or this social learning within your, your, your uh, subdivision then, but also on a meta level, maybe not necessarily European, but anyway, on a, a sort of meta level where we bring municipal workers from different neighborhoods together to also exchange uh, on, on, on the capacity building in their own projects. So that the capacity building, if you keep it to this one case, it will never be so uh, durable or uh, drastic than when you combine it with a sort of meta capacity building process uh, on, a, on a higher level, again, with particular stakeholders. So that was for us a big learning in, in our trajectory and one which we take on and, and, and in, our, uh, in our current projects. So we invest now as much time in developing local capacity building projects as some sort of learning studios on a bit more a meta level uh, in which we invite uh, similar people. Mm. And so you were touching upon this a bit. Um, how would you say that your work has, has then made an uh, impact? Like what remains when the project leaves? I think you're, you're, you're saying a bit of this now. It's a nice quote here in the corner where it seems you had interest from some, some large players. 
Um, yeah, there was another lesson learned. It's pharmaceutical company. Um, when we when we were entering these subdivisions, we always looked at policymakers. I mean, they will have to change regulation to make things possible. So we would thought we bring these two together in a process and make them change their way of working, both of the inhabitants and of of, of the policymakers. But then in one of the the subdivisions, by coincidence, there was a big pharmaceutical company next to it. And he was so gigantic that they, of course, had much more means than uh, uh, the municipality. They had their own um, sustainability managers. They had their own uh, participation managers within the company who had to deal with frictions between inhabitants and the company. But then when we entered into conversation, we thought, why only dealing with friction? Could you not play a sort of proactive role or another role in not only change the way you work yourself, but also in the subdivisions next to? Uh, it doesn't. It didn't turn out to be a very evident trajectory because they have uh, a lot of issues within a pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical context of intellectual property. I mean, you cannot just say too much because then. So mm. they they were very reluctant. But anyway, we had them uh, in a, in a number of steps involved in a number of steps uh, discussing how maybe um, their employees could make use of the subdivision and could help make it more green. The bicycle paths we were talking, or Katarina was talking about before, um, uh, indeed advising their, their their employees to take to come to work in, in with, with the different types of transport, so that they could also have an impact in the redesign or the redevelopment of the subdivisions next to their uh, mm. company. Thank you very much. Please stay in the in the discussion. A little more. Um, here are some quotes in the policy recommendations and the interviews with the projects. And I will leave these on the screen for some inspiration for our discussion. Um, but I would first like to invite now Christian uh, Wilk from the European Commission. Um, you've been listening in so far on the discussion. Um, what do you find particularly interesting, or do you have any uh, comments or questions? Well, as you might know, I joined the project very late. I joined this unit in uh, May and was appointed as the PO for ENSOF. And uh, this is during the last uh, months of the project. So I was mostly in touch with Vincent from uh, mm. the Dutch uh, funding agency about the process, how to close the project. So this is my first uh, touch with the project on a content level. And mm. thank you very much for the invitation it's a uh, very informative and uh, i also got access to material i thought didn't exist because i was not made aware of it so uh, the project report which were submitted are quite different than the material produced by the project itself and it's good to see that there is exists a lot of content that was produced well, I'm I was following on the discussions and the presentations and uh, well, uh, some of my questions I already posed uh, in the in the chat, the one on the differences between the lessons learned if they are generalizable or if they, I mean, when you start doing such interviews, you already have in mind or you expect already some kind of lessons learned based on your own experience as a researcher. So my question was more towards the direction. The ones you found out, the five you put on screen, did they match your own expectations based on your experience in capacity building? And in which sense the one, the five uh, were specific to the city context? Uh, I was following the last discussions and uh, I think Oswald, uh, when Oswald was talking about the meta structure, because I wanted to ask actually another question on how successful or how, how much could you benefit from bringing people together from very different social backgrounds, having started different solutions or projects in their neighborhoods? Or was there an exchange of people uh, leaving their comfort zone, so to say, going from one neighborhood to, to a completely different one and seeing how other people uh, managed to solve or address certain uh, challenges. Mm -hmm. 
So I, I was just wondering, did this happen or do you see potential in this, in doing this? Because even, even for myself, I mean, I grew mm. up in Germany and he, even Brussels is quite different than a South German town in, in how they address things, how architecture, how places are uh, designed. And I just came back from holidays to Switzerland, where again, it's very much different than in many other countries. Mm. So I was wondering if there also exists an exchange on that level between cultural backgrounds in addressing city problems. Because again, coming back to the initial question on the focus, Great Britain, Benelux countries are quite similar, at least in my uh, experience or impression. Hmm. So maybe- Is that a question for Oswald? Or was that a general question to the panel? It was a general question, but I think mm -hmm. Oswald maybe has the most immediate uh, comment or uh, answer. I would like to, to pass on the question to Merlene because it was a conclusion we had. It's not something we did. It's a conclusion that we we, we did it, of course, among the, the, the project leaders and the, we had the, in our team uh, professional actors. So um, people who, who were developing our tools, they exchanged but we realized towards the end that in fact, maybe, I don't know if exactly citizens should do this, but for sure, uh, municipal workers, maybe uh, steering members of a citizen collective could do that, but we didn't do it so far. But I guess maybe it was the foundation of Merlin's project, so. Yes, uh, so uh, thanks, um, Christian, for the for this question. So I have to admit that then that that the, we we did our, our main focus. The, the the studies were in these countries, right? The UK, uh, uh, the Netherlands, and Denmark. But we also visited Poland and and uh, uh, Krakow and and Lisbon. Um, I think there were a lot of uh, boundaries crossed, so to speak. So also, if, if, if we take a city like Birmingham and there, uh, the neighborhood we looked at there, there are some characteristics that that are uh, to some extent similar to the to the to the neighborhood we studied uh, in Amsterdam, but but there 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 are always uh, important differences, and it so it depends on on the the possibility to really. Um, um, be there and see something. And we cannot, we have not eye tracks whether there were people who were astonished, who, who were really, uh, so, so we didn't really, uh, the, 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 uh, what you see and what you notice is that there are people uh, really crossing different kinds of, of boundaries. And because the, the, the people we work with uh, are often uh, quite open-minded in the sense that they're, they're trying to make a difference. So they, they look for all kinds of ways of doing that. Uh, they, they do not have that possibility of, of crossing all these boundaries. They already have uh, some, so for instance, cultural, uh, social boundaries to cross uh, where they work and then taking them to other places for us and for them, I think, uh, has, 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 has offered uh, various, uh, various moments of, uh, oh, is this possible? How did they do this? So we took them not just to the cities, but we asked the cities to, to take us to, into the neighborhoods to show a project, to, to show the neighborhood, to get more of this, this feeling of this is what they're working with. And, and that's, 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 of course, that's different than paper. And we try to put that on paper as well, but the experience of, 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 of visiting, of having people take you uh, to a certain place and explain what, what they're working with what they try to change, uh, that's special. Mm. I'd also, if there are no immediate comments, I'd also like to pass the word to Jonas Ulund. Uh, you were part of this call, so to speak, since the beginning or when it was created, um, when it was decided to call it SMART and all of that. And uh, now you're in the middle of working with a, with a new urban partnership that we propose to the next Horizon Europe. Um, and so in the beginning, there was questions about, you know, was, what was the expectations then? 76 cities involved. And uh, did we expect that? Like, what is it like for you listening in now and, and hearing these uh, stories? Well, it, it, it's... Uh... Well, hello, everyone, and thanks for inviting me. <laughs> Great to hear a lot of it. I mean, 
I, I fear to show you my notes, but <laughs> it's all over the place, kind of. Um, but but I'm trying to listen a lot to my kind of from from the programming point of view, uh, and to think about what we what we wanted among the different funders who who kind of came together, uh, struck up this. Uh, partnership around these thematics with the European Commission. And I mean, of course, it wasn't the numbers in that sense that we were out after, although it's very, very interesting to see. But, but it is interesting to see the kind of the, the way we shape these kinds of calls and, 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 and what some of the outcomes are. Uh, I think one thing that strikes me now which we couldn't have anticipated back in, what was that, 2015 or so, um, uh, when we were drafting this, um, is how a lot of what you're talking about actually connects or it, it shows a way of how these types of projects can really contribute, I guess, to the Green Deal in one sense, but actually the new European Bauhaus movement, right? which is, it, it's becoming something um, in, in, in the European setting where we really need to be able to use the, these ways of working in co-creation. So, so that, that's perhaps one thing. Um, I, I think it was really interesting to see, for example, the, the ways of thinking about mediators or to use those kinds of technical concepts, but researchers or research innovators, uh, kind of the, the, the more typically, the conventional project initiators, right? Are usually uh, researchers, researchers, innovators and how they are acting or how you are acting. Uh, I mean, not as kind of uh, cold instruments, but rather in a co-creation fashion, which means that you're actually part of also translating a lot of what policy is thinking about or, or, or trying to work. But I mean, we, I think we still have a lot of policy that is thought to be implemented rather than translated. And you're showing a lot about how things are translated on the ground. And I mean, also the kind of challenge driven ethos uh, when we're talking about local actors actually knowing a lot more about the problems, the challenges, the needs, and how they are, well, articulating or helping to articulate this. You talked about the concept developments, etc. I mean, that, that's so important when we're looking at these big kind of overarching policies at the moment, and not just the new European Bauhaus, but we're also talking about the SDGs, right? How are we going to do that without these kinds of translations. So I'm, 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 I'm very inspired by hearing these, uh, what you have been doing in, in the projects. Uh, I may stop it there to just, to just bring along the discussions, but I, as you saw, I have more notes and things that I've been thinking about. I'm sure you do. Um, do does David or Marilyn or Oswald want to comment on this? Um, Anyone can take the floor also, or if you want to make a comment also about finalizing your projects during the pandemic, was there, are there any lessons learned that you want to share or advise others? Marilyn, you unmuted there. Yeah, yeah, I, I just wanted to say that it's uh, apart from what we're working for in terms of, of the urban, uh, I think uh, also as researchers, uh, we, we grow through this uh, project. So, so and developing new things uh, on the basis of what we learned for, for me, it was a, was a very important journey also as a researcher to, to see what's possible and to also get a little bit in a, a bit out of the comfort zone in, in terms of, uh, okay, living labs, uh, what might that be? Let's try to do something like that and then develop something. And, and, and in the end, uh, also uh, be aware of, okay, this, this now we've done, uh, others are doing the same. So what can we learn from what the others did and how can we uh, uh, make something new? Uh, still, still an urban researcher uh, for the future. So I think that it's um, 
we shouldn't forget that apart from policy lessons and, and articles and all these things that we uh, that, that we can publish and, and share and all the local learning that has been going on. Uh, we as researchers also uh, grow through this. Uh, so so I, I'm, I'm really eager to also take these lessons uh, forward in, into new uh, projects. David? Yeah, I just have a, I don't know, mm. an idea <laughs> or a thought uh, that came uh, when I was here in the discussion also about the applicability and also about policy making. Mm. I would say here, for instance, at our project, we had the same structure, the same methodology, uh, also how to structure and uh, to finalize our policy recommendations. And what I actually found out, <laughs> a very new idea, the geography map matters. I mean, we had the same methodology, but there was a clear, I would say, divide, especially north-south divide regarding how to address, how to communicate um, with the policymakers, how we were actually um, received by the policymakers. So uh, here, I don't think there's one common um, recipe for that, uh, especially maybe because our partners from, were from the Nordic countries, from the UK, from the Eastern and Central Europe. So we had quite different experiences there. Uh, I would say um, it's difficult to talk about one ideal way to approach uh, or to translate, um, I would say, also certain uh, ideas into policy making. Mm. Uh, that is actually an art by itself. And like I said here, geography matters. It's very place specific. We cannot talk about, you know, strict replicability of policies um, across Europe. That's uh, what I would say. Uh, but I would also say here that not just, I mean, there's also a way to influence policies, not just through policymakers, especially I would say in our case in Southern Europe, maybe Southeastern Europe, um, uh, gaining I would say, a critical mass within the local community that then influences the policymakers, mm. make certain changes, is it was actually or proved to be maybe even more efficient than uh, involving policymakers uh, from the very start, for like less, for instance, in the Nordic countries in Finland, um, where that uh, solution proved to be the best. So yeah, I, I would say there is uh, and there is no uniform solution, unfortunately. Uh, but fortunately, geography matters. <laughs> Europe is different, and that's a good thing. <laughs> As a human geographer, I'm I'm very. Uh, eager to agree. <laughs> um, so we're stepping into our final question. We're going to unfortunately end soon here. Um, so yeah, the call says smart urban futures and smart can be many things. It's often understood in terms of smart cities concepts, but you've been exploring smart urban futures in, in, your, in your projects. And uh, David, you, you already gave some advice here for policymakers, um, but just Oswald and, and Marilyn, you, I'll give you a chance, just a quick two, three sentences, one piece of advice for an urban policymaker that wants to create a smart urban future. Who wants to go first? Oswald. <laughs> I, I, maybe uh, I can say something, be strategic, don't uh, want to address all groups, don't want to address uh, all issues, choose mm. the groups, choose your issues to work on and, and uh, yeah. build long lasting relationships, as it says here in one of the quotes, with those groups, then the rest will, will follow. Thank you. Merlin. Yes, I agree on that. And I, I'd like to say, so we looked at people trying to make a difference and we, we went into the neighborhoods to, to first look for these people. And I think that policymakers, uh, if they do not already know these people, they should go and look for them themselves anthropologically, go into those neighborhoods, spend a lot of time there, drink a lot of tea or whatever you, you can do with them. And then make sure that you understand what, what keeps them from, from being successful, uh, which is often uh, something has uh, something to do with policy, uh, which often uh, can be mended in, 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 in uh, quite easy ways, uh, just uh, star for starters by acknowledging and, 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 and um, showing respect for what all these people are doing. Mm. Uh, th that will be a, a great start. Thank you for your advice. And thank you to everyone uh, who've been in the panel, Marilyn, Oswald, 
David, Christian, Jonas, Katarina, Robert. And we could go on forever here, but we're going to wrap it up. Um, and you can find soon the synthesis reports will launch on our web. So keep eyes open. Make sure you get our newsletter from Urban Europe. And you can find all the materials on the NSIF call page. Uh, so thank you. We're going to end the webinar. Goodbye, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks a lot for this. Really well done. You too, Jonas. <laughs> <laughs> uh.